Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so it, today what you'll see is just sort of a cross-section of some of the projects that, that we've done. And uh, what you're going to see today is, is mostly a cross-section of some of the projects that we've been working on. Um, uh, with one of one, from a very early uh, point, we, we decided that in order for digital art and digital artists to take the rightful place in our canon, we needed to interface with institutions, these important cultural uh, you know, corporations are, are important gatekeepers. And, it, and, and we need to respect that and sort of uh, have a conversation with institutions. And then the other very important uh, uh, constituency of the art world that we needed to get buy-in from was art financiers. And if you get the collectors, you get the institutions, and you get the fairs and, and the artists, along with the financiers, then all the pillars would fall and digital artists would take their rightful place in our canon. Something that I see as an ine inevitable period, like moment in, in time, but has not happened today. And so what we did is we uh, took some of our different artworks and we went out to major institutions. And so what you see here is People's Glo Global Tour, where that has evolved from first to Castella de Rivoli, then to M Plus, uh, and now to, to Crystal Bridges, and then on to another major American institution later this fall. And we've added live updates. And this concept of a river in time that art can change and art of our time does change, I think is a really important theme. Uh, I, I think it, it matters to a new, a new generation and a new culture. Outside of this, we've done a lot of work with Rafiq Anadal, really the defining uh, AI artist of our time. So what you see here is uh, our record-breaking show at Serpentine. It broke the Serpentine's attendance record in just five weeks. Um, and what does this tell us? This tells us that this art that is a river in time that evolves, that changes, that when you come back to it, it's something new and different. This is one of the key things that will bring museum goers back to museums after COVID. So uh, we first had done a, a show with Rafiq at, at MoMA and then followed it by the Serpentine. It broke records in both places. And now we're seeing other institutions all around the world wake up to the fact that this is a way to get museum goers back to their, to their museums and interacting with uh, sort of a younger audience, uh, so to speak. Uh, and here you see the, uh, the Rafiq uh, unsupervised MoMA edition. Uh, to our knowledge, this broke the record for average time spent by a museum goer in front of a piece, uh, tracked in at 28 seconds. The highest ever at MoMA behind it is Starry Night at 21 seconds. And that's really what you're after when talking with museums, 20 seconds. If you can get uh, museum goers to spend 20 seconds or longer in front of a piece, that is the holy grail of museums. And if we can get museums to adopt this work, then that brings the entire class of digital artists and digital art along into acceptance in, in our canon. Uh, and so this was a wonderful piece that was done as a mashup of a, over 100,000 pictures of the MoMA's work. Uh, and the machine learning algorithm sort of reimagined that. From Rafiq's work, we work with a lot of other uh, uh, digital and AI artists of the Succession Styles. Uh, we're doing a project later this year at the Serpentine with Paul Herndon, um, another wonderful AI artist. And you see that one of the tools that AI natively gives us is that art can evolve as this river in time. And that is very core to the concept of, of what we do. So that's the museum interface. The second part is the art finance. Uh, my core business and our crown jewel is a yielding machine where we're able to create high interest yield using DeFi primitives without taking DeFi or crypto risk. We have this automated machine that makes thousands of loans per day and we're able to, to generate really compelling yield. And because of that, we can go and take lend against some of our assets and then put it into our yielding machine and we're able to generate uh, compelling yield against these important cultural assets, which help then uh, with the acceptance of the, of the capital A. Market. 
Uh, and so we've been doing this now for over a year, and we've had some really amazing lessons along the way. One of which is that, incidentally, CryptoPunks is the highest loan-to-value art lending asset on planet Earth. You can get higher loan-to-value on CryptoPunks than you can on a possum. Um, and recently I talked with one of the most prominent, largest art financiers in the world who didn't know that people were getting 65% loan-to-value on CryptoPunks. And when he found this out, he would stop the dinner and all he wanted to talk about the rest of the dinner was crypto pumps. And so that's a really interesting insight that has emerged from our crossover into the, to the capital A art world. Um, very quickly here is Sarah Montmayoas, a wonderful conceptual artist and really one of the original uh, uh, artists in, in, in Web3. She, she actually produced her first NFTs, Bitcoin, which you saw behind me, before uh, the launch of Ethereum. Uh, so, somebody to, to, to keep an eye out as well. CryptoPunks, uh, I'll, fin I'll finish with, and I'll finish with a prediction that crypto for a contemporary art museum to have a CryptoPunk in their collection will be as necessary in the future as having the Warhol is today. Uh, these are really important cultural assets that define an important moment in time uh, in our culture and in the art world. And it is my prediction that you will see major global institutions adopt crypto pumps moving, moving forward and recognize their important moment as innovation in art and their important, important sort of cultural monitor. Uh, and so with that, I'll be around all day and uh, happy to, to talk with anybody about the crossover of, of digital art and museums. Uh, thanks very much.